Good evening, folks. Uh, here on the McDowell couch. Um, and I just, it's kind of late here. Um, I probably should be getting ready to go to bed. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of share a few thoughts. Um, so, you know, I've been uh, doing a lot of research around like simulation modeling and social computation and the ant computer. And, uh, you know, I've been off of most social media other than my channel and my blog since last summer, end of middle of last summer, July. And, you know, it was hard sort of getting detoxed off of all of that. Um, but I, you know, I made good progress. And, but something happened uh, yesterday, actually, that uh, got me to, I'd never really looked at these sub stacks. I think that there's a whole sub stack culture and um, I hadn't engaged in any of that, but someone drew me into, uh, someone pulled some material that I had um, done actually a year ago uh, and sort of built their own post off of it and uh, fundamentally misrepresented uh, the nature of the information that I had shared in the clip. And after many hundreds of comments, um, I ended up sort of deciding to get an, a, an account. I ended up deleting it tonight, but um, just to kind of try to remind people of um, hey, there's people attached to these things that you, you know, these, you know, smeary sort of things that people put out. And, uh, and I just got to witness, I spent a good chunk of time, you know, and I was, I was generally, you know, I think I was very fair um, and reasonable and trying to really have a conversation because this conversation about uh, Web3 technology and uh, emerging tech, you know, the, the web three and the finance and the repurposed drug market is, is big and it's important. And it's really important now that RFK Jr. has come out with his presidential candidacy and that, um, you know, back in February, Steve Kirsch, the billionaire, uh, who's the one really pushing um, the repurposed drugs and developing these innovative financial models tied to these innovative drugs, you know, the ones that are being, um, you know, have been set up really since the beginning, if you look at it in retrospect, uh, to sort of usher in this new wave of, um, you know, pandemic med medicalization. And um, yeah, it's important. It's an important conversation. It's not easy. <clears throat> I get that it's not easy. Most people who are sort of in these silos are, are attuned to certain kinds of conversations. They have certain <coughs> conversations that are the allowable conversations than other conversations. Maybe they don't directly say, oh, we don't talk about that here, but they don't talk about that there. And this stuff takes work to understand. It takes work to understand the finance piece, how it meshes with the tokenization, how it meshes with these major players who are positioning themselves in the resistance. Um, you know, I've had concerns because my focus has been impact finance uh, for, for, I don't know, at least since the fall of 2020 about uh, RFK Jr. and Children's Health Defense, given his background um, at Natural, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, which when I, I looked at the funders of that uh, were largely funded by the same philanthropies that are the ones that are trying to take over the schools and um, you know all of the, the major players, including Rockefeller um, for years. And the fact that he was in venture capital and in these uh, sort of climate tech, health tech, clean tech technologies. Um, so I've like butted heads in the past and I'm, I'm allowed to have my opinions. I mean, I think if you're going to be somebody who's going to, you know, um, run for office, you should be able to tolerate that there might be people who have opinions, who, who would like to, you know, ask you questions, ask for clarification. Um, and so, yeah, so I spent a couple days and it was, it was kind of like a, um, an interesting window because I think I'm, having been outside of it for six months, I could see it with a clarity. And what I saw was essentially in the first day, this person, and you, you can look up, I have two blog posts on my blog on Wrenching the Gears um, that sort of go into this. I, I documented it, so I have documentation. Um, now I've I since deleted my account, so all of my the comments that I made just say delete. So if you could, if you go to these two uh, Substack posts that this person made, um, you'll see many deleted comments and those are all me when I deleted my account. Um, but yeah, so I could sort of see how people were being managed and, you know, I, with, with a lot of clarity and 
the truth was is that it was clear that most of the people hadn't watched the clip in question that had to do with uh, the repurposed drugs. And they didn't even probably have the framework or context to make anything out of that. But and yet they didn't they weren't curious enough to ask for clarification, um, but they just sort of followed the leader and then they presumed and then they made their own assertions based on the lead person, um, because I think there's a certain pecking order and there's a certain dynamic that fits into these communities that, that build up um, around the, the Substack. Now, but I did actually stop to look and see who uh, created the Substack and his name is Chris Best. And I thought it was quite interesting because, um, you know, all the most many of these techie people are pretty young. Uh, the job that he had had before creating the Substack was something called Kick, K-I-K, uh, and it was mobile application devices. And then um, uh, from Kick, he developed something called Kin, which was like a token. And so this is part of this uh, tokenized media space that I've been talking about for a very long time. I think, you know, I've been talking about it in the context of Rockfin. But I, I, I saw early on at the Annenberg School of Communication at Penn uh, several years ago, back in like 2018, 2019, that they were developing uh, this blockchain media concept. And so, uh, and he actually had come out of the University of Waterloo in Canada, which I found is interesting because I don't know if you guys saw um, me being booted off a webinar for sort of explaining about impact finance to this group, the Tamrac Institute. Uh, but the uh, Tamrac uh, Institute was is based out of the University of Waterloo. And in Waterloo, Canada, uh, that's the center where BlackBerry uh, was based. And the two founders of BlackBerry were our major philanthropists in that region. And uh, one of them, and I, 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 I'm forgetting the names right off the bat, but one of them endowed the Perimeter Institute, which is Center of Theoretical Physics, and, uh, and then also a quantum computing center at the University of Waterloo. And then the, uh, the other one who had worked with Jordan Peterson on issues related to the United Nations uh, affirming that actually, like, in, you know, he said he got the bad stuff out of this agreement, but they, they were, Jordan Peterson and the other found, co-founder of BlackBerry were, had done work together around the UN. And then this person had endowed in, uh, a government innovation institute at Waterloo. So the fact that this Substack individual is coming out of this milieu of, of Waterloo is very interesting to me because I feel like what's actually happening with this is a social simulation and is actually an ant computer is a it is a hive mind and and it was quite something to see the hive mind in action um now once i deleted my account said person sort of offered you know and, and you can you can look at it for yourself but it was sort of a non apology apology and i think it was clear that i had deleted my account and so then the ground was paved for um essentially just really unpleasant things to bubble up in that. And it was, it was interesting just to, you know, and I, I stopped looking because it really, it's bad energy. It's really, it's, it's sad. Um, it's really sad because I'm, I'm sure these aren't bad people. They're not, they, they don't, but several times I, I, I put in my comments, I said, look, you, you don't even know me. And you're, you're making these uh, sort of pronouncements about my character that are inconsistent with who I am. And, and, and you don't know me and you're doing this because the platform has conditioned you into doing this, right? I mean, you wouldn't normally do this 10, you know, 15 years ago, we wouldn't have done this to people. What, and, and, and look where you are, just pause for a minute. You know, I'm here to show up to say a human being is attached to the things that you're putting out there. And what is it kind and is it productive? Or is it simply part of the the hum, the din of noise? Because in reality, across the two posts, you know, I was kind of shocked that this person decided to make a second post about me after the first day's post. I'm sure maybe they got so much engagement. They thought this is a great idea. Let me do it again. Um, after hundreds of posts, probably 600. Um, and I would say maybe a third of those might have been mine. Maybe not a third, but, you know, a quarter, maybe. Um Still, no one was actually talking about the substance of my argument, which was about the the finance, the emerging finance of repurposed drugs, uh, and 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 the implications, uh, specifically linked to the Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s Fauci book, and the implications 
you know, I had pulled quotes from that book that implied that at the time that he wrote it, that this there was this idea that uh, there was a pandemic that we that that people who are asymptomatic should be tested and potentially compelled to take these protocols. And and that's a problem because I don't I don't think that's anything that any of us would want. And then you know I, I spent some time revisiting RFK Jr.'s. Um, there was a presentation by this woman Liz Mumper Mumper I think uh, in December of I don't know if it's 2021 about safe vaccines. Um, and yeah, so she was just she was talking about the new technology of personalizing everything. And so it's just sort of putting these things together and, and thinking, but we couldn't actually have a conversation. Um, we we liter literally, there, there was lots of talk about di of dialogue, and yet um, the individual who made the post absent herself after sort of doing her dog whistle and then, and then left. And then she showed up again to start the next one, and then she left. And so there wasn't actually a dialogue. There wasn't a, an exchange of any meaningful information. And yet people, uh, their time was taken up um, by this platform. Their energy was sucked up into the simulation. Um, and yet nothing productive came of it. And what I realized too is because I've noticed this um, not so much when I've, now that I've, I've been able to sort of pre-record mostly on my streams and then be in the chats, um, but there were these entire sidebar conversations. So it was almost like someone opens up a post and then it's like a clubhouse and you can go talk with your friends in this sidebar conversation that goes on and on and on about something that maybe is only very tangentially related to the original post, but it's like a hangout place. And then you, and, and so it's this online weird community. And cause I was scamming, I was scanning through the post trying to find if there was like where it was appropriate to comment and to try to offer my perspective and fill people in. Um, and yeah, um, I guess I don't, I don't, I guess that's about all I want to say. Um, but I think we really, you know, with this candidacy coming out and with the Steve Kirsch backing of money, um, you know, I just invite people to reflect on what is the resistance. I don't, is there a resistance at this point? I think there's a lot of thought police and um, narrative shaping and narrative framing, um, a lot of spectacle, a lot of grandstanding. Um, not a lot of authenticity, um, not a lot of, um, I think, people being responsible actors in the space, um, not a lot of humanity. I think that's that's what I said. You know, I, I kind of showed up to say, hey, I'm here to try to preserve your humanity. So just re reflect on that, reflect on your behavior um, and realize that this matters. This this matters. Um so I just I just wanted to get that off my chest and just ask people to to pause and think, do we want to be slaves to this thing? Is is this how we want to run our society? Because it's it's um, one, it wasn't productive. It wasn't like there were actually really good conversations happening there. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had my own issues with trying to find places to have conversations um, with like minded people, uh, not conversations because I want people to like fawn at me and, you know, pat my back and say, oh, you're the best and, you know, whatever. And uh, um, ooh and ah, not that, because that's that's not what I think is going to move, move us forward. I think we need mutual collaboration and and to engage in the world in a curious way and in a collaborative way. Um, not in, in, in that the influencer culture isn't conducive to that. I don't think it really isn't. Um, so, you know, I don't know, there was a lot of, you know, I did end up getting a lot of, you know, views for me, you know, and I'm a tiny, tiny little blog over here. I think people forget that there are even WordPress blogs anymore. I think they presume everything is Substack. you know, everything is sucked into that. Um, and, and maybe I got some people to think about some things. I was trying to introduce some new ideas. Um, but I was just mostly left with a sense of, um, emptiness over it all. Um, it was just, it was, it was, it was empty. It was a very empty, um, empty place. It was spiritual. It was, it was, um, maybe, maybe that's not the word, but the, it was very busy, um, very busy, but it wasn't going anywhere. It was just 
staying in place. Um, and it, 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 there wasn't reciprocity. There, there wasn't reciprocity there. Um, there was probably a lot of stigmergy, a lot of artificial pheromones. Um, so, you know, the other day I was doing this, per this pervasive day, uh, and I didn't, I ran out of time and I, I think I'm going to read through some of this because I think it's, it is important. This is the stuff, you know, I think, unfortunately, um, I think people want to portray me. I mean, not, but sometimes it's been like, oh, you're brilliant or you're this or you're that. And I'm like, I'm not, I like, I spend a lot of time. I'm not smarter than anybody else. Um, but I'm dedicated to trying to figure this out. Um, and I think that that is intimidating for some people. They're not sure where to latch on, um, which is why I'm going to keep reading these books. And if you're out there walking your dog or mowing the lawn or, you know, running errands in town, like you can listen to me. We can figure this out together. I did have someone say, you know, I was trying to talk about the simulation um, and that I actually thought that part of maybe what the, these posts were, were part of the simulation. And, um, you know, because they had brought in this event to a one. And I'm like, yeah, in retrospect, I, I'm realizing that this event to a one, like if you're you're having Johns Hopkins tweet about viral plush animals, um, it's probably um, it's not a secret. They, they want you to know this stuff. Right. But they, they probably don't want you to sit down and listen to Allison reading a book about pervasive computing. <laughs> and, you know, one of the people said, well, it doesn't really matter. All you need to know is that the mainstream media is bad. And I said, well, that's not it, actually, because in reality, it's about managing mindsets, managing storylines, managing narratives. And so they're fine to have an alt media narrative or have many alt media narratives, even like the quote unquote fragmentation, because they're um, as long as they can tag you. Right. They have your email when you sign up and they know all the things you clicked and how much time you spent on it. Like they can manage all of these things. It's interesting. I think the AI finds all of these unique little subsets interesting. Um, so you actually need to do the work to understand the landscape, which is like I told you before, like this scary, these scary things on these little, you know, wave forms um, or you're going to get lost. And I, and I guess I saw a lot of a lot of lost people the last two days. Um, they were really lost. But at the same time, they thought they had all the answers. And I think we don't have the answers. Um, I think it, it probably serves us right to be seekers and to be seekers for ourself, to be self-guided, um, to collaborate and to build relationships and to hopefully build trust and to hopefully um, be good friends, uh, be good colleagues, um, genuinely apologize when you've hurt someone's feelings and, and figure things out together. But it is that doing it together that is, I mean, doing it together, but doing it from your own place. You, the, the influencer culture I, I'm, I'm realizing is, is very, very problematic. Um, because it, it essentially narrows, like, you know, I'm not saying, you know, clearly the decentralization part is part of Web3, but there is, there are all of these ideas. And if we all are all looking <clears throat> grounded in our own lived experience and trying on the different lenses that people offer, like, hey, why don't you look at it within <clears throat> the context of frequency? Okay, why don't you look at it within the context of nanotechnology? Okay, why don't you look at it in the context of financial instruments, or a, a transmedia narratives, or, you know, uh, natural capital? You, why don't you try looking at this in many lenses, and then through that depth, you get that understanding. And so you don't have to be the expert on all of the things, you have to be the expert on what makes sense to you in the place where you are. Um, so this is just a, a, maybe a long way of saying, I'm going to go ahead and read, uh, the introduction for this pervasive day, because, uh, even though it might seem geeky or boring, um, if we don't understand the game that we're in, we're not going to, um, I don't think we're, we're going to be able to strategize very well. 
<laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So, and if you want more information on what I'm talking about, um, you can certainly uh, go on. It's the, my last two blog posts. And, um, and there is a third one that this individual on, if you go to, you'll see on the, on the blog post, there's one that went up tonight that is sort of the, in my opinion, a non-apology apology and opening the gates for, um, you know, blood in the water. Oh, good. She's left the room and now we can be our real selves. <laughs> and if you're curious what the ant computer looks like um, in action, you you might go there. Oh, and one other thing. So and I, I, you know, I wish it's terrible because when I don't have people's I'm never great actually with real names, honestly. And then when people have their avatar names, I'm even worse. But someone uh, included a comment today about Substack that I was not aware of. And it was really helpful that uh, it was actually built in. And I don't know if this is for all the Substacks or only a certain subscription <coughs> that people can choose to participate in as a writer. But they were building in income sharing agreements, which is something we've talked about before. It would be like one of these ledger technologies. I don't know that they're specifically on a blockchain ledger, but they would be doing that. Um, that's what would be coming next. And so they would sort of front uh, writers a salary. Um, I don't know what kind of salary, but a chunk of money, they say, for their first year of writing. And then they would take 85% of their uh subscription premiums and then eventually sort of switch it around, I guess. Uh, but in some ways, it's sort of like this idea of an income sharing agreement. And what I do want to point out is that what the AI wants most next is culture in the creative class, right? The creative economy. And so it does want to shepherd the creativity into the cybernetic circuits and not just the, the, the creators, but the way in which culture and society interacts with the content that those creators make. And so I think that is what Substack is. And if you imagine that maybe these advances, these cash advances are kind of like essentially would be a universal basic income for the creative class, right? The people who are going to be put out of work by all of the AI art making. Um, I feel like that's an important part of the conversation. And, and I don't know that, that my sense is, is that honestly, it looked a lot like a middle school lunchroom, like cafeteria scene, <laughs> like a cafeteria click scene. And I don't know, like maybe if people are in the click and they've, um, you know, they've spent more time in these sub stacks, if they feel the same, but it definitely looked like, like, you know, who's at the popular kids table and, and all of that sort of this, this pecking order. And, um, and these are all, I mean, I'm assuming these are adult people, <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to watch. Um, but there are these to, to, to underestimate the role of the algorithms and the data being fed in the predictive analytics and the steering and the stigmergy, I think we would be very naive. And it seemed to me that most of the people in this particular cohort who are commenting on these two posts, um, they weren't really prepared to have that conversation. Really the, the vast, vast majority, um, of the comments they were either related to some particular quirk, you know, some particular topic that was of interest, not necessarily related to the post. The post that where I was trying to talk about the repurposed drugs totally got hijacked into the virus, no virus narrative. And that that's, you know, and, and as I see it now, that's clearly part of the game is to obscure everything. And, you know, between you and me, like, I'm not a joiner. I'm not I feel it's much more likely to be sort of an environmental contamination, a toxin, and far more likely, like I'm much more interested in research around nanotechnology and frequency largely uh, based on, you know, following the research of my friend Steffers, who's, who's done a very, very deep dive in that. And I think that's vitally important. So while all of the, the tempest in a teapot over this particular framing of the conversation uh, steers people off into oblivion and non-productive conversations. We're not having actual productive research about things like nanotechnology, um, nano electromechanical machines and micro electromechanical machines and non-surgical BCI and all of that. Like we're not having those conversations because literally people are caught in a vortex. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my, that's my two cents. So, okay. Uh, chapter one, introduction, this pervasive day. And for people who missed the last, uh, beginning read aloud, essentially this is based on, this is by Jeremy Pitt. He's at Imperial college, London. 
Uh, it's a compilation. So he edited this book. It was from 2012. So it's over 10 years old now. And it was funded by the EU and they wanted a book uh, promoting pervasive computing, ubiquitous computing. And so what Jeremy Pitt decided to do was he had read a book, uh, a 1970 book by Ira Levin called This Perfect Day, which is here. Um, and it's, yeah, Ira Levin also wrote Rosemary's Baby. I think, I don't know, it might pre, maybe this is a couple years after Rosemary's Baby. Uh, but it was essentially about a world run by Unicomp, a giant supercomputer. And everyone was giving monthly doses of chemotherapeutic drugs to keep them docile and with the program. And in many respects, I think that this is sort of the slightly updated version of We, you have Yeni Zemian, We, which I did a read aloud of, which is essentially living in a world built by math. So, uh, so that is the context. So he thought it would be a great idea to, to talk about pervasive computing. He, he named his book This Pervasive Day um, and compare it, set it within the context of Ira Levin's This Perfect Day. Um, you know, okay. So uh, chapter one, introduction, This Pervasive Day. Uh, Jeremy Pitt, Imperial College, London. And every chapter starts with a quote from The Perfect Day book. It must be true, Lilac said, it's the final logical end of Woods and Way's thinking. Control everyone's life and you eventually get around to controlling everyone's death. This perfect day, page 116. 1.1, Levin's legacy. The genre of science fiction is as an extra, sorry, the genre of science fiction as an extrapolation into the future is often rooted in the fears of its present. In the Western Bloc during the Cold War in the 1970s, these fears included nuclear holocaust, communist hegemony, and technophobia, in particular chemistry, genetics, and information technology. This Perfect Day, a science fiction novel by Ira Levin, 1970, imagined a supposedly utopian global society governed by a single computer called Unicomp in a compopoly, a computarchy. <laughs> Similar to other science fiction novels, this particular vision avoided apocalyptic nuclear conflict, but touched a number of socio-technical nerves or possibly aspirations of the time, including the following concerns. The potential of computers or robots to be smarter or better than people. Manned planetary space exploration and settlement. Planned economies producing social, political, and cultural conformity the use of chemicals to control individual emotion, contentment, well-being, and even death, uniformity of food production and consumption, genetic manipulation, and that, uh, and that the Chinese win. Of these seven concerns, writing in the 1969 to 1970s, at the start of the U.S. Apollo space program, and despite the achievements of the space shuttle flight and unmanned planetary probes, only the manned exploration of the solar system seems hardly to advance in 40 years. With respect to the final five concerns, one might argue that it is the victory of the market economy combined with the rise of multinational corporations and the pressure of globalizations that is suppressing individualism at personal, communal, and national levels. Furthermore, the scale of consumption of antidepressants, painkillers, and other chemically engineered products of big pharma has created a society that is increasingly dependent on drugs with corresponding increases in health and social problems. Similarly, the global industrialization of the food chain, the prevalence of processed food and the ubiquitous brand recognition achieved by certain soft drinks and fast food suppliers have gone some considerable distance to homogenizing food production and consumption. This is not always a force for good. Consider the rise of obesity in affluent countries and the still unequal distribution of food in the supposed third world. In connection with this, genetically modified food has created a debate concerning its potential benefits, disease and pest resistance, as well as tolerance to extreme conditions, leading to increased food production as opposed to the environmental impact and long-term health effects and the interaction of the law of intellectual property rights in the food chain. This debate has ensued and is ongoing even before the arguments over the potential impact of full genome sequencing have been fully explored, discussed, and understood. Finally, the geopolitical significance and increasingly increasing economic ascendancy of China is a necessary factor to consider in any economic or diplomatic policy debate. 
Therefore, it is not only of academic interest whether or not the social, political, and or environmental developments of the past 40 years render Levin's vision of a futuristic society plausible or even desirable, but it is also reasonably reasonable, timely, and important to have a debate about the impact of globalization, industrialization, pharmaceuticals, genetics, and technology on the trajectory of the society in which we actually live, as it relates to the society described in the novel. The primary target of this book is to address the first of these concerns, the potential impact of information and communication technology on society, up to and including the rule and direction of humanity by a computer. That's the cybernetics. There are two questions to consider. The first question is, is it feasible? Would it be possible to build and program a computer to fulfill the functionality attributed to it in Levin's book? This is the ostensible purpose of this introductory chapter. The second question is deeper. It asks that even if it were feasible to build such a computer, the society it rules is not inevitable or unavoidable. So what then is the potential for and perils of the necessary computing and communications technology for actual human society as we experience it in 2011 from a social, legal, ethical, political, and or economic viewpoint. We will address these questions in the following order. To begin with, we will review the essential aspects of the society in this perfect day. Uh, and then we will address the first question and examine the computer and communications technology as it is represented by the anti-hero of this perfect day the Unicomp computer, in comparison to the advances made since the book was written. And finally, we will set up the second question by considering the potential and perils of this pervasive day, and then hand over to the contributors to provide the answer or an answer to this question in their chapters. 1.2, This Perfect Day. In This Perfect Day, Ira Levin describes a quasi-utopian society of completely contented people. There are no nations, everyone is one family. There are no individuals, and there are just eight names, four for boys and four for girls, and any other identification is by nine character alphanumeric namber. Choosing is frowned upon as an act of selfishness, and everyone looks the same, male and female, and everyone enjoys a communal living with enough to satisfy the lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For example, physiological, there are set sleep hours. Everyone has a boyfriend or girlfriend with whom they have sex once a week on Saturday nights. And there are, there are total cakes to eat and Cokes to drink at communal meals. Clothing, everyone wears coveralls, which are almost completely identical. Security, in terms of personal safety, no wars and no crime. Indeed, hate and fight are swear words in this society. And no need to make selfish, in other words, personal decisions. Employment. Uh, everyone has a job, a classification to which they are assigned and which they all profess to enjoy. Health, not just doctors, but they also have counselors called advisors and love, forgiveness and belonging from their friends, immediate family, and the simple fact that they belong to just the one family. For this basic level of satisfaction, the members of the family have to thank uni. The ritual dialogue exchange is not thank you, you're welcome, but thank you, thank uni. Unicomp, or just uni, is a supercomputer which controls almost every aspect of everyone's life. Who gets assigned to which job? Who gets to travel where? Who gets to access which resources? Interactions with Unicomp is either through scanners against which people place bracelets displaying their neighbors, or by using wireless computers called telecomps or comptrollers. It turns out, of course, that uni is controlling more than just this. It decides who lives and who dies. People die of quote-unquote old age at 62, more or less, and suppress the higher end of Maslow's needs, in particular self-esteem and self-actualization. This control is affected by the ruthless administration of chemotherapeutic drugs and regular treatments, which vastly diminish the human capacity to think, feel, criticize, or indeed act as anything much other than sheep or cogs in the machine. So far, just another science fiction dystopia, but it is also one of the finest in its genre, and it compares favorably with 1984 and Brave New World. It is part social commentary, part action thriller, and part simple romance with any number of twists. However, the advantage of science fiction as a genre is that it can not only be used to tell a good story, but that also that alternative societies and cultures can be portrayed via the futuristic conceit 
usually as a metaphor for exploring concerns of present societies. So there was a strong element of Cold War concerns about the suppression of individuality, sexuality, and culture, and the compulsion for passivity, conformity, and compliance in Levin's quasi-utopian society. For this reason, males and females were presented as physically identical. Men and women wore the same unisex clothing, no other, for example, coveralls, and there were only eight names and so on. And furthermore, passivity was culturally predetermined by the use of language. For example, fight and hate were swear words, while certain other four-letter words, F-words, were entirely acceptable. And recreative sex was entirely open, but reduced to once-a-week functional and perfunctory Saturday night routines. All of this was reinforced through rote education, chemical treatment, and advisory supervision. Forty years later, these same concerns remain at the heart of sexual, racial, cultural, and generational discrimination and diversity within societies, along with the uneasy tension between the individual and the state across almost all societies, and the growing concern of how people and cultures themselves are almost always being redefined by ubiquitous computing, continuous visual stimulation and entertainment. Using hindsight, we must remember that the purpose of Levin's book was to engage in a satirical social commentary and a critique of contemporary issues. He wasn't concerned with actually trying to predict the future. So when, in the next section, we compare the computer science, information technology, and inter interaction affordances of Unicomp to the state of the art at the time of this volume, it is not to evaluate if the fiction turned out to be right or wrong, but to see where we are now and to expose how the technology relates to the social issues raised by Levin. 1.3, Unicomp Revisited. The main protagonist of this novel, Chip, is taken on a visit to Uni. And this is a quote. The voice of the elevator spoke in his ears, telling him while the light showed him how Unicomp received from round the world relay belt, the microwave impulses of all the unaccountable scanners and telecomps and telecontrolled devices and how it evaluated the impulses and sent back its answering impulses to the relay belt and the sources of inquiry. Yes, he was excited. Was anything quicker, more clever, more everywhere than uni? This perfect day, pages 24 and 25. And, you know, I just, I really do feel, like I said, I've, we've, I've spent two days sort of immersed in the, this ant computer, and it, it does feel like something that's hoovering up all of this kind of information. As we steered, uh, as we uh, stressed above, the objective of this section is not to critique or evaluate the science and technology behind Unicomp. Instead, we will first consider the basic issue of the feasibility of constructing such a computer, its peripherals and the necessary communications network. And then we will review advances in human computer interaction, the computing infrastructure and the potential functionality of such a system. This review will reveal that the technology has advanced much farther than Levin could have possibly imagined. Considering uh, the time of publication, 1970, and its relation to the quotation at the start of this section, the following landmarks in the history of computer networking are worth noting. In the 1950s, long distance telephone calls within the United States were usually carried by microwave radio relay in the uh, relay links. The internet timeline indicates that by 1970, there were five nodes in the ARPANET the forerunner of the internet, and that the first packet radio network, Aloha Net, was in use in 1970. Only in 1972 were the two networks joined together. Wireless LAN protocols, for example, Bluetooth, use microwaves in the 24 gigahertz band, while metropolitan area networks, for example, WiMAX, use the 2 to 11 gigahertz range. In December 2008, it was reckoned that there were 4 billion mobile phones worldwide, the number of embedded, micro, embedded microprocessors by any definition of the term is literally unaccountable. Google, uh, not the only search engine, responded to a minimum of 10,000 searches a second. And while response times are dependent on many factors, it is not often a problem. Although Levin was unable to predict either the invention of fiber optics or the proliferation of the microprocessor, the global networking infrastructure and the response times of the book are safely achievable today. In his fictional world, Levin was necessarily terse about the genesis and evolution of his perfect society and the computer which controls it. The text hints at a time when there were five computers, one for each continent, and measures time from unification, when all five computers were replaced by a single computer, 
in other words, Unicomp. The brief description of the machine room described Uni as occupying two levels, each of the 1,240 mammoth steel blocks. In the real world, Google operates a warehouse-sized computer server farm in a building which offers approximately 100,000 square feet of data center space. And depending on the type of servers and applications, a typical size rack can contain between 10 and 80 computing nodes, and between 20 and 60 racks can be aggregated into a power distribution unit. And with a footprint of approximately 11 square feet, uh, oh, sorry, units, um, sorry, if each of Uni's mammoth uh, steel blocks equated to a power distribution unit, then on a rough approximation, we can conclude that it is physically possible to build a unicomp sized computer. However, given the energy requirement for running a data center, which normally presents a 50% energy overhead for cooling, one of the main physical problems of the warehouse sized computer is the power pro provisioning. Uni is given a nuclear reactor or two as its source. Levin does mention refrigeration. The fi fictional computer required near zero temperatures for superconductivity, a theoretically fast way of circuit switching, but not yet used in any real commercial computer. But this does make the decision to situate uni under a mountain not perhaps such a smart idea. Nevertheless, superficially, the basic construction of uni, wireless access devices, global internet, central supercomputer, was a reasonable extrapolation of the technology of the time. And the basic properties of speed and capacity in terms of bandwidth, numbers of connected devices, raw computing power, have been met by contemporary technology. In the rest of this section, we address in turn the issues of interactivity, functionality, and infrastructure with respect to the other properties of more everywhere and more clever. Moreover, we consider if we had built uni, we could, uh, sorry, moreover, we consider how if we had built uni, we could interact with it. Interaction. Uh, the book mentions the following three forms of human computer interaction, HCI or data input. Firstly, each person wears a bracelet with his or her neighbor. They have to hold the bracelet to a scanner which flashes green for yes and red for no in any decision. And that's the smart contract layer, guys, right? And the digital identity. This could be to access a building or a room within it, boarding a plane, having a toy, making a phone call, all examples from the novel, and so on. Secondly, the advisors, but no one else, have portable wireless devices, telecomps, which use keyboards with a dozen black keys to enter data. There is a reference to voice input telecomps replacing key input ones as a sign of technical progress made in years six or seven. Thirdly, there is one instance where a member speaks to another neighbor into a phone in order to call him. Considering each of these in turn, the bracelet scanner combination seems plausible. The state of the art in optical character recognition, OCR, is such that in principle, it should not be hard to read the nine character identifier of the number irrespective of the angle at which it was pointed, at which it was presented, given control over font size, etc. In fact, the limitation here was not to consider the possibilities of miniaturization and the instrumentation of the bracelet itself. If it was necessary to implement such a scheme in 2011, radio frequency identification tags embedded in the bracelet itself would need to be used. Then some form of access control system, as often used in city transit systems, could be implemented. The advantage is that the RFID tag on the bracelet <clears throat> can be used to store data. And then localized processing, in other words, located in the scanner or nearby computer could decide yes or no, rather than needing to consult a single central computer directly over every decision. Although as with an Oyster card in the London transit system, the scanner or card reader intermittently updates a central database. On the other hand, the idea that the keyboard or microphone are the sole input mechanism for the computational device with text and speech as the only signaling system used for communicating information and the restricted use of wireless devices to a segment of the population, nowadays people carry multiple microprocessors with them, are extremely limited. This, of course, turns out to be far from what is actually possible. For example, using scent, emotions, gesture recognition, facial recognition, and even neural activity. Okay, functionality. Uh, as indicated above, one scary aspect of the book for a 1970s U.S. and Western European audience preyed on the Cold War-generated uh, fear of a Soviet-style planned economy and surveillance society <coughs> taken to an extreme. 
The Unicomp made every decision, in particular job assignments, for example. As a teenager, Chip is told by his advisor on discovering that Chip is thinking about his own classification, quote, you have been given hundreds of tests since your first day of school, and Unicomp has been fed the results of every last one of them. You've had hundreds of advisor meetings, and Unicomp knows about those too. It knows what jobs have to be done and who there is to do them. It knows everything. And now who's getting to make the better, more efficient classification, you or Unicomp? And that's, again, the blockchain mastery transcript, right? Traditional computing models uh, store data and retrospectively analyze it. In 2009, IBM proposed a new computing model called stream computing, which analyzes data in real time to provide what is called perpetual an analytics. IBM describes the technology as using computers to rapidly analyze multiple streams of diverse, unstructured, and incompatible data sources in real time, enabling very fast, accurate, and insightful decisions. It is not therefore unreasonable to suppose that the combination of both retrospective and stream analysis could provide the planning and logistical functions ascribed to uni. In another case, uh, Chip is denied a toy because previously he had been teasing a scanner. The iCars exhibition uses a sensor saturated environment to infer high level behaviors from patterns of low level actions and signals to affect usage policies of interactive exhibits. These policies include formal expression of permissions, namely who is allowed to do what with which objects. So in one sense, the functionality already exists. More generally, other functions could be implemented, although as mentioned previously, the computing model would more likely uh, use distributed computing techniques rather than a centralized one. And that again, that's the Web3, right? That's, that's the, the Web3 technologies that we're talking about, distributed le ledger technologies. Um, you know, and this is this is 10 years ago. So and it goes, you know, and I'm sure Levin was was anticipating it in 1970. Uh, therefore, what could not have been foreseen, haha, but should have uh, should should not be underestimated are the following three developments. Firstly, stream computing, which makes real time event recognition possible. And there are algorithms which add semantics to events so that we can move from event recognition to complex event or situation recognition. And that's the simulations, right? Uh, secondly, cloud computing, which makes shared computing resources available on demand, but means that your data, once stored on your own hard drive, is now stored on someone else's hard drive and crucially owned by them. Thirdly, ubiquitous computing, which creates electronically saturated physical environments. The convergence of stream, cloud, and ubiquitous computing provides an apparent single point of access for all individuals' computing needs at the time and place of demand. However, from the software engineering perspective, the hardest part of converging ubiquitous stream and cloud computing and of ensuring service interoperability, security, uh, maintainability, availability, and other non-functional requirements is the job of the system's architect. In other words, the limiting factor is human design capability and ingenuity, not the software or the hardware. Despite the missed opportunities of ubiquitous computing described in the book and the fact that service delivery is given better by the cloud computing paradigm than the mainframe or client server paradigm, uh, the real issue in delivering functionality is not so much the physical engineering, but the abstract systems architecture and the computer science behind service interoperability. These are the essential foundations for using the full rich range of signals described above to develop an entirely new socio-technical functionality in healthcare, transport, education, sustainability, uh, and social networking. And so I just wanna speak a little bit about the interoperability. That is the digital identity. Again, uh, having, a, you know, even though it's supposedly decentralized, like a, a single access point for all of the data that accrues to you through tokens as you're interacting with the digital environment. And it's those tokens are all signals, right? And I just want to point out that I um, I was sifting through a couple of talks by RFK Jr. Uh, to put on the channel, and I, I noticed in several talks, and, and even going back some some time a, a, a ways back, uh, his frame was very much about uh, free market economics, which is interesting because he I think he's running as a Democrat. Um, 
which is, you know, the free market economics is really more of a libertarian angle. Um, but he, he had it within this frame of like crony capitalism that it's, you know, we have a problem with crony capitalism, but we need true free market capitalism. And it was all about, uh, he was, he was against this idea of subsidies, uh, because it was distorting the signal. And so that's really important to understand because that is where they're talking here about ubiquitous sensing uh, with your digital identity is that you're, it is a signal. So you're sending a signal to a car, to a door, to a, a, another person for a payment. Uh, th th those are all signals. And, and, I, and, and then there are signals that are happening at other levels inside our body. And, and really what Oliver Reiser has been talking about with World Sensorium is that we're neuroblasts and part of this global brain, this forming global brain. So if, if you imagine that the biochemical signaling within the body is similar to the social signaling, the social physics using digital identity and Internet of Things, um, and then that is extrapolated to economic systems, um, that this this free market economics and I've, I've talked about this before, like with the Eric Weinstein discussion, he wants to link biophysics and econophysics and social physics, all of those things across, and and people aren't understanding that. Like, but through our signaling, I think that there is some sort of goal to uh, use these market based economic principles to optimize us into some extra human level, and and this is where I think that the resistance has has. And I don't mean to in any way diminish the harm. And I know that people have, um, you know, been lost over the last few years, but it's not a mass die off event. It's it's a mass data harvest event. And it's, a, it's an effort to create the biggest pool of interoperable uh, structured data to train the AI systems. And then that data isn't just going, you know, and, in, in you know, I'm open to sort of hearing what people think about it, but in, increasingly I'm thinking that the singularity idea that's being sold to us that it's about a computer attaining uh, some sort of consciousness, uh, which I, I don't think is actually possible, but that's how they talk about it, is that perhaps the singularity is what they're talking about here in uh, the perfect day is unification. Like, so they were unifying the computer into Unicomp, but they were unifying all of the individuals as a family. And this was sort of mass ego death into this unification protocol. And so if what they're trying to build is like a human, a bio hybrid computer in which humans are a key feature, um, maybe the singularity is the erasure of us as having an identity and, and melding us into a socio-technical system that, that feeds into this, a new kind of supercomputer that has um, the essence of creativity that, accrues to humans that isn't present in a machine. And so increasingly, that's what I'm thinking about with the singularity. Um, okay. Uh, let me just... Re okay. Um, despite the missed opportunities of ubiquitous computing described in the book and the fact that they that service delivery is, a, is given better by the cloud computing paradigm than the mainframe, uh, the real issue is delivering functionality not so much the physical engineering, but the abstract systems. Okay, so I already did. Okay, so sorry about that. Next page. Uh, infrastructure. The key point of the previous discussion is that uh, the minimal traditional style of interaction described in the book could be achieved. Indeed, it is actually possible to go well beyond it with current technology. Furthermore, the functions supported by Unicomp could be implemented and it is possible to deliver analytics and logistics, health and education on a local and global scale in short term and long term scales. In addition, there are various other aspects of infrastructure, in particular communication channels, which were not anticipated in the book. This includes firstly that advances in camera technology, image processing and data storage have made possible surveillance and identification techniques using biometrics, of a far more sophisticated capability. And secondly, it includes microprocessor miniaturization, which coupled with advances in surgical techniques has made it possible to implant microchips in the human body. This same uh, miniaturization has, been made has made possible sensors and sensor networks which differ in scale, form, and measurement from simple optical scanners. And thirdly, at the other end of the scale, satellite technology uh, timing and the portability of devices has made tracking an individual's location potentially continuous and highly accurate. 
However, given the number of devices in operation, there is a fundamental issue in keeping everything powered. All right. And that's that's it's the it's the energy. And and so that's, again, what I'm going to point out is and, and I need to put together, um, just pull together all of my information and about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and, and apply my lens to it, which is the social impact finance lens. Uh, but if you look at Vantage Point Capital Partners, where he was a, a managing partner for quite a few years and. It's interesting. I, I don't know if anyone can find a LinkedIn for him. I think I saw one and it didn't really have anything but his education. Um, it doesn't say that he actually has ever left Vantage Point. So I don't know that he has. I think he started in 2009. Uh, and there were uh, there, I've come across stuff that says he was at least there as of 2014. So I'm not sure like if he is faced. I mean, some people at Children's Health Defense has said he has left, but I've only seen no proof of that. And his page is still up on, on their website. Um, so, but what Vantage Point was investing in, uh, if you look at their portfolio companies, it was a lot of batteries, a lot of alternative energy and batteries. And, and actually that was his focus at Vantage Point was in um, solar, solar panels and connected grids. So I think that this is all very important to consider um, in, the, in, the, in the conversation. Okay. Uh, keeping things powered. Yeah. The consequence of this is that human computer interaction is no longer just a conscious action, but a continuous activity and even possibly unintended, uh, what Aloua Fersha calls implicit interaction. If the sensors are embedded in your clothing, wearable computing, uh, where clothing, shoes, or jewelry provide the interface or implanted under the skin, such as, uh, that the body is the interface, then there is no switching off or even opting out. The logical extrapolation of this is that an individual is never offline and can be uniquely identified. And if the internet never forgets, there are severe repercussions for the social and cognitive function of memory. Uh, furthermore, there is no necessary requirement for the telecoms not to have a uh, motor system of their own uh, or for the scanners to be static as advances in robotics have made both interactive and mobile terminals for example, robots and mobile surveillance by UAVs or unmanned aerial, unmanned aerial vehicles possible. However, there is a requirement to supply enough power to keep all of these new channels open, wearables, implants, robots, and UAVs for communicating the signals. And I've talked a little bit about this before, that they're developing um, fuel cells, actually, uh, that run off excess glucose in the blood. And there's a lot going on with... Um, in the impact finance space around diabetes and pre-diabetes management and um, glucose monitoring. Now, some of these wearables and, and things like artificial organs, they're imagining that you could uh, harvest electricity from piezoelectric, like off your blinking eyelids or off the, your swallowing, like off of your, your Adam's apple and, and various things like putting tiny little sensors that every capture, every little bit of your body movement. Um, but then there's also looking at, at creating these fuel cells based on your blood, literally excess glucose in the blood. So I'm wondering, like, are they trying to keep people on the verge of diabetes and keep blood sugar high in the body to run the fuel cells that are going to be running the transmitters and the energy? I mean, that seems very likely to me. <sighs> okay. Uh, 1.4, uh, this pervasive day summary. So there are three main conclusions to be drawn from comparison of real computing with the fictional Unicomp. Firstly, like all the best science fiction writing, the essential technological basis was accurate for its time and predictive in its future. It has withstood the test of time, uh, and there is nothing far-fetched in the novel concerning the information technology. The starships in anti-grav gear, as it turns out, remain science fiction. Secondly, in point of fact, there is no reason to suppose that we could not build Unicomp today. Thirdly, in point of fact, there is no reason to suppose that we have not yet already built Unicomp. So that's, that's kind of crazy to think about. So he's saying that there's no reason that we couldn't build it. And in fact, it may already be built. It is this last point that is the motivation for this book. It is crystal clear that we do not understand, uh, appreciate, or have fully thought through the social, legal, economic, and political implications of the technologies that we are developing and deploying. For example, the convergence of data mining techniques, social networking, location-based tracking, and advanced biometrics are all conspiring to have a profound impact 
on the thumb generation and their understanding of the social construct of privacy. Yet there can be no doubt that it was the proliferation of instant messages through social networking sites that exposed and collapsed the super injunction, which precludes mentioning that there is even an injunction in the Trafigura case, uh, which in turn sheds lights on some of the murkier aspects of UK libel law and political lobbying. Equally, as Morozov warns, it is delusional to suppose that social networking is an unstoppable force inevitably advancing democratic ideals and civil liberties, and that autocratic governments can use these methods equally effectively for their own political purposes. Indeed, the message is not lost either on supposedly democratic governments that political control can be achieved by saturation, surveillance, and superficial entertainment. Hence, one might argue the proliferation of CCD uh, closed camera TVs in the UK and the infiltration of undercover agents into peaceful and legitimate protest groups on the one hand, cheap beer and easy porn for the boys, salacious gossip and soap opera for the girls on the other, and pseudo participation, strictly X factor reality TV trash for all. So there are forces for good as well as gauntlets to be run. The potential and perils of pervasive computing. Uh, this book aims to expose at least some of them uh, using this perfect day as a backdrop to the discussion. Uh, chapter overviews. Uh, the structure of this book is as follows. It starts with the idea that ubiquitous or pervasive computing is a reality and that slogans, interfaces as territory and the disappearing computer have materialized. There is no longer a box, a user and an interface between them. The environment is the interface and the user is in the environment. And so the user can also be the interface. And then it looks at new signals that can be transmitted through the interface. What new functionality can be created from processing these signals and the new communication channels that the user as interface paradigm provides. The new signals considered are electrical activity in the brain, scent and emotions. The new functions are healthcare, sustainability and social networking. And the new channels are wearable computing, implants, robotics and UAVs. So I just, I just wanna point out here again, the, the communication channels that users are the interface and that the signals are electrical activity in the brain, scent, and emotion. And so I think, you know, what's happened to me the last couple of days, like what I witnessed in the Substack environments, uh, which were very artificial, like very, very artificial. And, you know, I could be, I don't know, like even when I was on Twitter, I didn't follow people. So it was a certain way of looking at things. I didn't really get enmeshed in, in sort of group think things like these uh, stigmergic, but, but I think the, the idea of electrical engineering, and, and this is increasingly what I'm thinking about the digital currency and these devices, which I have one myself, right. But that it's, it's an entrainment. It's a frequency. In fact, you know, I was talking with Steffers and I, I asked, I said, cause she, she works in, in like a healing modality. And I said, am I right in, in thinking that a lot of apps like on phones are doing like quote unquote energy healing, like remote healing. And, and so if we, we understand that they could listen to you or turn those phones on or other things, they like could, could they also be emitting other frequencies that entrain your, your heart, you know, energy or your mind energy into, you know, group mind or a certain kind of behavior. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's very, very likely. I mean, they're, they're just not, I mean, they're not, telling us, I don't know, maybe if we keep reading the book, they'll, they'll talk about that. Um, so this use of emotion as a triggering mechanism and, and as a stigmergic and, and, and actually Lynn and I, we recorded something. It'll, it'll be a bit before it's out, but a, an, another thing about OER, but she was talking about a particular individual and that what she noticed in the testimony to, to the legislators around these certain bills in Texas was that people would come up. These are people from the privatization movement and of education. And they, um, these are people who are very attuned because these are investors, uh, venture capital investors in a lot of neurotechnology. And they would initially present sort of a tragic story opening, like something very triggering and personal, um, and then move on, like segue into their testimony, which seems strange because I think you only get like two or three minutes. Although I guess if you're the connected people, you get more time. Um, and she noticed this becoming a pattern. Um, and I think it's because there's something about the neuroscience of provoking people into a certain mental state. And I think that that's what I was seeing on the substacks was that emotion was being manipulated 
to control people. And yet these were people who were choosing these certain online environments because they thought they weren't controllable, that they were outside of the control grid. And yet they were in the control grid, but they were in the water and they didn't even know what the water was, that sort of thing. Um, and anyway, you know, for what it's worth, what I saw was that people would repeat inaccuracies um, and then an inaccuracy would be pointed out and then they would repeat it again multiple times as though essentially you could overlay onto any reality your false reality. Like you could, wh what was happening to me, I think, across these two uh now three posts was I was being remade like the essence of me as Allison McDowell. There were attempts to remake me uh, using my um, the material that I put out into, you know, shared wide, widely and freely um, into something else. They, they were trying to transform me into some other archetype, really. And then to use that archetype for their purpose, which in the context of, of this presidential run seemed to be a political purpose. Um, and I guess they, I, I don't think it was really about me per se. Um, I just happened to be in a convenient um, object, but I, I think it actually is a very dehumanizing program to, to treat people in this way and then to, uh, to objectify them, to remake them in a new image based on the digital portrayals and then reinforce that through uh, sort of groupthink and parroting and and then act as though this new reality is the reality um, and then and essentially disconnect the person from their own identity um, which is you know you have to sort of it's it's kind of crazy it's, it's like you know you have to argue like who you actually are and they're like no 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 you're this thing we just made this thing we, we made you like this you know because we need we needed some widget that looked like, acted like this that filled this capacity for this particular purpose that we had. So you're not you anymore in this digital world. We've just re decided to remake you. And, and that's very, that's very troubling. Um, okay. Uh, so anyway, so it's talking about emotion and uh, the, the use of emotion as the signal and the brain waves and, and then, uh, and then scent. And that's something uh, again, Steffers had brought to my attention because she did a really great piece at a piece of mindful about a uh, Febreze actually. And, uh, the idea of, I think it was some sort of nanostructure in Febreze uh, that would contain scent molecules. And that there was something about that uh, containment mechanism that was also uh, could pass the blood brain barrier or compromise the blood brain barrier, which is really what they're trying to get out. They're trying to like get into there. Um, and so I, you know, through her work in that, I was paying attention to scent. And that was part of when I went to the Motel Monel Chemical Census Center over at the, the Penn uh, Biotech kind of hub on Market Street, I was I was thinking about that, this engineered scent and that the IEEE people are trying to engineer scent. So I think they're trying to get into these higher levels that are almost like subliminal in the subconscious to, to trigger, um, I don't know if it's just to trigger reactions or maybe to get people on, on a level that they can enter into the group mind. Um, so I think that that's, I think that that's right. Um, okay, so where was I, emotion? Okay, so the new functions are healthcare, sustainability, and social networking, and the new channels are wearable computing, implants, robots, and UAVs. We open with the new model of interaction and close with the general problem of keeping all the channels powered up. In more detail, Alwa Fersha uh, introduces and discusses this notion of implicit interaction. Human-computer interaction with Unicomp was based on conventional forms. This included keyboards for data entry, scanners for access control, and so on. However, the real uh, prospect of pervasive computing means that it is not just what you do that is significant, but it is also what you don't do that is potentially significant. And while implicit interaction is required to support speculative computation and other forms of proactive behavior, there are other implications for how information can be used at different levels of complexity. Uh, and electroencephalography, EEG, the measurement of electrical activity within the brain has a number of diagnostic applications. More recently, the measurement and processing of these signals has been proposed for identifying cognitive processes and so can be leveraged as the basis for a brain-computer interface. Originally intended to support users with impaired physical or cognitive function, Ricardo uh, uh, Chava Riaga and Jose Milan describe the state of the art and consider some applications for assisted living. In this perfect, the perfect day, there are no cosmetics. Everyone looks the same anyway, and supposedly no artificial fragrances like perfume or aftershave. 
However, scent has been shown to have a profound effect on mood, physiology, and psychological states. Jenny Tillotson in chapter four explains the use of the olfactory system and devices in human computer interaction and explores the concept of sense on a scent, S-C-E-N-T-S, on a chip, an invisible nanochip in a future society whose bidirectional functionality allows it to release mood altering fragrances and sniff the surrounding atmosphere. These sensing devices are already small enough to be embedded in smart sensory clothing, jewelry, and other fashion items. Chemotherapeutic drugs were used in the novel to suppress extreme emotion. The aim of affective computing, on the other hand, is to use physiological signals to infer those emotional states. The idea of what Nicola Serbegia uh, calls reflective computing is to use those emotions to adapt the computational environment to the user in an inst uh, instinctive, un unobtrusive, and non-explicit manner. On the, on the one hand, this can make future control systems that are friendly, personalized, and responsive to the needs of an individual user. But on the other hand, there are questions of control, trust, and privacy with respect to the ownership of user-generated environment data, and that needs to be addressed. A part of this... Uh, uh, part of this user-generated environment data, the recording of physiological signals can be of a significant benefit in healthcare applications, as discussed by Simon Dobson and Aaron Quigley. However, as mentioned above, in the novel, characters die at the age of 62, more or less, ostensibly because of old age, in reality for reasons of efficiency, population control, and resource management. Clearly, the Hippocratic Oath, essentially do no harm, was not preserved in the medical profession of Levin's novel. However, a more general aspect of the Hippocratic Oath, that of uh, patient confidentiality, um, all that may come to my knowledge in the exercise of my profession or in daily commerce with men, which ought not to be spread around, I will keep secret and never reveal, is more pertinent to today's society. Indeed, verifying that personal implicitly generated data remains private and in some sense is a common concern in both healthcare and reflective applications. Now, I will just point out that I think that this is like really lame, this whole idea of um, privacy. I mean, not that I'm against privacy per se, but the question that I'm trying to ask is like, do we want to live in pervasive computing? Like, what will it mean? To, is, this, is this something that we have to accept? Because... The reality is, I, I think if you went down to a busy sidewalk and and ask passersby, like, do you know what pervasive computing is? Do you know what a socio-technical system is? Do you know what a cyber-physical system is? Um, do you know about a unique digital identifier? They would have no idea. Not only would they not know what they are, but they wouldn't really have the capacity to think through what what it meant or, or how it could go wrong. And so that's... Um, yeah, so this idea that you can be private, you know, I keep saying, you know, use the the idea of an access point, um, the grocery store, right? Because we, we've seen that the last three years, there's something that is a basic need, you need to have food, the food is in the grocery store, there is a door in the grocery store. If there's some sort of behavioral token that you need, demonstrating compliance to open the door, it doesn't matter if all of your data is private, and that is this whole zero knowledge proof discussion. It doesn't matter if it's private, um, if when you walk up to the door and people are in line behind you, you can't get in. Like that's the problem with living in the outside in robot. And, and that's, so I think that this, this, this framing of it as privacy is a false choice. Um, and, and, and understanding, like this was 10 years ago that they knew that this was um, coming, right? They needed the digital, they needed the name bird, the, the interoperable digital identity. And, you know, I was doing a lot of tracking. And, and again, if, if, I, if, you know, those of you guys who run around these Substack things, like, are there people talking about, like, the particular applications of digital identity beyond just like, they're going to try to control you? Because um, I was writing about that in 2018, when I was first getting a handle on blockchain, and I was actually doing research on uh, the Medicare system, and I, Med Medicaid, actually, I think it was Medicaid, and um, looking about blockchain healthcare records and how they were going to manage the populations and all of the technology that was involved. And so, you know, that was 2018, but he's writing this in 2011. So, you know, seven years previously, they already knew what was coming. They already knew that they were going to build the outside-in robot and they needed distributed ledger technology to, to run it. 
Um, so we're we're just really behind. And I think I think that's the part that's so tragic about what I saw on that Substack was that um, like people were just so lost. Like they 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 were super busy and occupied, but they 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 don't have um, like their brains were full of stuff that wasn't going to help them make an intelligent conversation about what's coming. And it was just, it was really depressing. Um, okay. So pervasive healthcare applications can also be founded on the idea of a mutual support network based on social networking. Levin took the idea of the nuclear family to its logical extreme from the two adult, two children family unit at one end to the entire family at the other and nothing in between. However, we actually have seen in the convergence of Pinker's observations about the evolution of language in order to satisfy a need to gossip with global networking instant messaging. This has had its upside as indicated above through the internet, enabling the fifth estate, as well as its downside, cyberbullying and grooming, etc. Walter Colombo et al. in Chapter 7 consider the prospects and outcomes for forming social groups and sharing information inside and outside groups. Social networking has a profound effect on people's knowledge, opinions, and behavior. Yeah, you're not kidding. Um, understanding the process of information diffusion, opinion formation, and compliance pervasion in social networks is important in getting people to change that knowledge and those opinions and behaviors. For example, in relation to social movements like climate change, fair trade, or sustainability. So I'm just, I'm just pointing this out again. Understanding the process of information diffusion, opinion formation, and compliance pervasion in social networks. Um, so that's what's being tracked, guys. That's what these social networks were about. It's the digital twinning and the predictive profiling, and then the understanding of how knowledge is shared and how it can be steered to a certain effect, which means to change people's behaviors in measurable ways. In this perfect day, members were expected not to be selfish and use resources wisely. The exponent of this was the coveralls, a functional garment that eschewed fashion and had marginal variations. Some medics are described as having coveralls with red, a red cross on them. Joan Ferrer, Chapter 8, uh, reviews a number of ways in which uh, fashions and textiles in conjunction with mobile and pervasive technologies can be used to promote the sustainable agenda and stimulate people's engagement with the sustainability issue. Wearable computing is also a theme of the first chapter in the collection on new channels. Janice Jeffries, Chapter 9, asked the question, could the society of this perfect day be seen as an ideal world? free of sexism and multicultural conflict, if only by the simple expediency of imposing monosexual and monocultural identities? Or is there a better way of accommodating culture diversity without the accompany division, accompanying division? These issues are explored in the context of generated shift, fashion, culture, and of course, pervasive computing. From the idea of closing clothing as interface, Katia, Katina Michael, and M.G. Michael, Chapter 10, consider the idea of a body as interface using microchip implants. With reference to this perfect day, effectively, this technology could have replaced the bracelet and the neighbor, as well as opening up opportunities for tracking and surveillance. Like scent, implants too can be bidirectional, and if implanted in a nerve, can be used to transmit the sensations of the implantee to a base station, as well as cause artificial sensation. This chapter looks at the controversy surrounding implant technology, catalogs its commercial development, describes two recent trials using the technology, records people's reaction to them, and considers some of the socio-technical implications. We step outside the body again for the next chapter, which considers robotics as a channel for communication. The point is that there is no absolute requirement for scanners to be fixed. Once they get moving, there is no requirement for them to only have sensors for perception. We can add actuators, displays, and intelligence, and we have a robot. And I would, I would say I think that these uh, uh, Boston Dynamics robots dogs are probably like these walkable sensors, right, with the tablets on their heads. The, it, we saw those a lot, right? We saw that those coming out during the lockdowns. You know, oh, you know, here, here your, you know, your concierge is a robot dog and, um, and with a tablet for a head. Uh, okay. 
Uh, Serge Kernbach considers the future of human-robot interaction and the people expectation, people's expectations of robotics. In chapter 12, the idea of a robot or a mobile scanner is extended to the UAV. It is not considered, this is not considered in this perfect day, but was almost anticipated by another science fiction author, Robert Sheckley. In his short story, Watchbird, uh, from 1967, he describes a UAV that, um, which is able to detect the brain signal characteristic of perspective murder. What? Of perspective murder? The watchbirds also have a learning algorithm and can communicate with each other, but unfortunately they learn wrongly and start classifying other signals as signs of incipient murder. And since they're, they are always equipped with an electroshock stun gun, they start zapping people for swatting flies and chopping vegetables and so on. Chaos ensues, so a stronger, more powerful UAV is launched, which is designed to hunt the watchbirds. And this, in turn, learns to hunt other things, and chaos ensues. Ken Warren surveys the state of the art in UAV and considers the sociopolitical and sociotechnical implications of the transfer of military technology to civilian applications. Sheckley does mention in his short story the recharging apparatus for the watchbirds. In this perfect day, one of the characters, Dover, does have a microchip telecomp, which he keeps in a matchbox, though how he uh, powered it is not mentioned. The requirement to provide power to so many microprocessors is an increasingly pressing problem. Paul Mitchison, Chapter 13, concludes the book with a survey of energy harvesting techniques for mobile devices and sensor networks and the power required to achieve what is described in the book, control over the weather system. Final remarks. We are living in a time when the human body is not just a sensor and processor of data uh, through its five senses and cognitive capability, but has become a generator of data just by virtue of being situated in a sensor-saturated sensor environment. That data can be integrated with millions, indeed up to 7 billion data streams and processed by systems far better suited um, to that activity than the human brain. The result, someone knows you perhaps even better than you know yourself. This data, in fact, enough clean data is clearly important for commercial, social, and political reasons. However, uh, the ownership of this data remains an open question. It is evident that as we advance into the unexplored territory of sociotechnical pervasive computing, we need to harness secure security models based on trust and forgiveness, privacy models based on understanding, information, sensitivity, uh, receiver, and usage usability models and the idea of design contractualism. The idea of design contractualism is that any design uh, decisions on security, privacy, et cetera, should be grounded within an appropriate model and on a mutual agreement or social contract. And that's what they're busy working on is, is redoing the social contract. And that is what Web3 is, is definitely about, is remaking democracy for this radical participation and, and reframing the social contract and social impact finance as part of that. Um, systems designers have to make moral or ethical judgments and then encode them into their design. There are, in fact, many examples of this already. Uh, copyleft, ACM, code of conduct, trusts, and so on. In the unlikely event that system designers will all accept their share of social responsibility, the question is whether enough users will vote with their feet in the forthcoming world of pervasive services and use the services of those designers that do. There is one final question that is not considered further further than here. The characters in this book anthropomorphize Unicomp, begging the artificial intelligence uh, questions about Unicomp. Is Unicomp intelligent? Is Unicomp conscious? And so on. And there is an answer of sorts to these issues in the novel, but no more spoilers. It is left as an exercise for the reader to find it. A more detailed discussion of this issue is reserved for another book. For now, we will put the metaphysical questions aside and address the fundamental issue. What kind of socio-technical, physical, and political world do we wish to inhabit? You decide. Only the chance, the, the problem is, is that we, we don't decide because we're not actually educated about what's happening and we don't have, we don't have systems to educate people. And we don't actually even have forums for discussion because we've been herded onto these platforms. And, and I'm not saying that like we, the people who are there have chosen to be there. Um, the people who are in silos have chosen to be in silos. Um, I mean, it's not like someone compelled people to do that, but that's the reality. And so, 
these these transitions are underway. We're, we're not actually deciding it. It's been it's been decided, and we're simply they're simply trying to figure out how do we create the conditions and the narratives um, to guide people into an acceptance of it. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to talk about, folks. I mean, there there's um, there are a lot of different things that we should be talking about. Um, I don't know if any of you listening out there know of people talking about pervasive computing per se. Like, I know we sort of broad, broadly talk about the Internet of Things or the Internet of BioNano Things, but like, what what does it mean to live in this outside in robot? What does it mean to live in responsive technology? You know, back and forth. Because um, that's that's, and then what is the role of Web three emerging tech in that? Um, yeah, I think I think it's time that we we spend some more time on that. So um, anyway, uh, lesson learned: uh, avoid substacks if possible. If you're in a substack, I would I would ask if if uh, are you actually getting something out of it? <laughs> are you just like is it just like a social exercise? Is it just stigmergy to feed the machine? Um, yeah, and where did these discussions happen? I know Juliet, you're always out out on the sidewalks and everything, which is great, and I think that's a great place for the discussions to happen. Um, so anyway, thanks for joining in tonight. I know it's a bit of a boring book, but I think I'm gonna I'm I'm really I'm I know I'm just gonna sure I'm gonna read the whole thing, but I think um, I. I'm really interested in this uh, olfactory part and the fashion part, the wearable convening, and maybe the batteries. I think maybe those will be the three chapters I'm most interested in reading out loud to you guys. So uh, we'll see how long that takes. I have a lot of projects going on, and I didn't really need to spend two days chasing after um, nonsense, <laughs> but I did. I did. So I, I, that was my choice, and that was that was a, ch a choice I made. I, I might next time I'll probably choose differently. So, all right. Well, good night, everybody. Be well.